अवधूत बाबा शिवानंद ले गुरु पद्म संभव शिव का परम भक्त होने होने का पाइं जो अब यो पनी प्रमाण किया था Avadut Baba Shivanand says that Guru Padma Sambhav was a devotee of Shiva. Is this true? According to the question here, Avadut Baba Shivanand has said that Guru Padma Sambhav was a devotee of Shiva. Here again, where is the evidence of this? He must have assumed that Guru Padma Sambhav was a devotee of Shiva simply because he carries a katwanga, which resembles a trishul or trident. But what Guru Padma Sambhav carries is a khatwanga and not a trishul, and it signifies something different altogether. The three spears that are on top of a khatwanga symbolize the three ratna or the three jewels, and to make such an assumption is like the saying in Nepali: "Jati jati kala madhiv ko sala banana jasto, hai na? Sappi sappi chakhu, sappi tarwar khugri ho banana jasto bahoyota." Jati Jati Kala Mahadev Ko Sala. That is, like saying that everyone who is dark-skinned is Mahadev's brother-in-law. It is like saying that all types of knives and swords are actually kukuris, which is a type of Nepali blade carried by the Nepali army. And by that logic, then the Islamic invaders like Bhaktiyar Khilji, who rode into India brandishing their swords, would have to be called Gorkhalis. Who are Nepali soldiers carrying kukuris? This is a ridiculous statement. First of all, Guru Padma Sambhav was brought up by King Indrabhuti. He appeared on a lotus and was brought up by the king. Now some Theravadis have questioned how it can be possible that he appeared on a lotus. But if you properly peruse the Theravad Suttas themselves, you will find the account of Venumati, who appeared in a bamboo. She was born from a bamboo, and other similar accounts are also found in the Theravadi suttas themselves. So Guru Padma Sambhav appeared on a lotus, and King Indrabhuti found him and took him to his palace. And his name Padma Sambhav means exactly this: that he arose Sambhav on a lotus, Padma. In Tibetan, he is called Pema Jugne. Pema means Padma or lotus. Actually, even in Tibetan, the word is written as Padma, but because they could not pronounce it exactly like that, it became Pema in the spoken language. This is the same as in their pronunciation of the word in the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum, and Jugne is the same as Sambhav, which means a rose, a born. And King Indrabhuti himself was a great realized master. He is one of the eighty-four great Mahasiddhas. Since he is a Buddhist Mahasiddha, his connection is with the Buddha, with Shakyamuni. There is no connection with Shiva there. Then again, after Guru Padma Sambhav had received all the teachings and transmissions from King Indrabhuti, where did he go to study further? Did he go to a Shiva Akara or training center? No, he went to Nalanda to study. The people of our Himalayan region should also well appreciate this fact. That Guru Padma Sambhav studied at Nalanda. It was after he finished his studies there that he came to Nepal and meditated at the Asura Cave in Parping. So nowhere in his history does it indicate that Guru Padma Sambhav was a devotee of Shiva. If he had been a devotee of Shiva, why would he have studied at Nalanda? Why did he study Buddhist texts? Why did he meditate in accordance with the instructions in Buddhist texts at the Asura Cave? Such statements are made by Hindu gurus who do not know even the ABCs of Buddha Dharma, based on their false assumptions that a khatwanga is the same as a trishul, and thus he must be a devotee of Shiva. It is apparent that it is based on this assumption that they make him into a devotee of Shiva. And when he came to the Asura cave to meditate, what kind of meditation did he do? He did Buddhist shamatha and vipassana as taught in Tantrayan, which is also called Vajrayan or Mantrayan. Now, this is not a Shiva system of practice. It did not come from Shiva, and this type of practice would thus not make one a devotee of Shiva. And in fact, the events that occurred during his practice at the Asura Cave make what Avadut Baba Shivanand said appear to be a joke. 
When Guru Padmasambhav was meditating at Asura cave, many worldly gods and goddesses from the Kathmandu Valley, including Pashupati or Shiva and Dakshin Kali, came to disturb his practice. Initially, he requested them to leave, asking them to go their own way and to let him practice his way. He had not harmed them and so to please let him do his meditation practice in peace. But they did not do as he asked. And please note here that Shiva or Pashupati was also among these gods and goddesses. And so Guru Padma Sambhav told his attendant to go to Nalanda. Now the people of the Himalayan region should also note here that he asked his attendant to go to Nalanda, the place he had studied at. Note that he is not from Tibet and he did not learn only in Tibetan and teach only in Tibetan. He is from Udiyan which is called Urgen in Tibetan. Thus Urgen means Udiyan, which is the present-day Swat Valley situated in northern Pakistan and Afghanistan. This region used to be called Udiyan and is in the same area as Gandhar. King Indrabhuti was also from Udiyan. Thus Guru Padma Sambhav was from Udiyan. He studied at Nalanda and then came to the Asura cave and meditated there. And thus, when these gods and goddesses kept disturbing him, he sent his attendant, who was a monk, to Nalanda to bring back the sadhana text of Vajrakile. This type of text is called Thyasafu in Newari and Pecha in Tibetan. As soon as his attendant crossed the border of southern Magadh and entered Nepal, carrying back this text, half of these gods and goddesses fled then and there itself. However, others including Shiva or Pashupati and Dakshin Kali still remained. And these were then brought to their knees by Guru Padma Sambhav through his practice of the Vajrakile Sadhana. Now based on this account, judge for yourself whether Guru Padma Sambhav could possibly be a devotee of Shiva or not. Baba Avadu Shivanandji probably has not heard of the story. And it was after this that these gods and goddesses made a pledge to Guru Padma Sambhav to protect the followers of his lineage if they offer bali or food offerings to them. Offering bali here does not mean slaughtering animals like in the Hindu tradition. The word bali is found in Pali as well and it means offering, offering of some food. Thus these gods and goddesses told Guru Padma Sambhav to instruct his followers to offer them bali and they would protect them in return. Something similar had also been said by Vaishravan and the Chatur Maharajikas or the four great kings to Bhagwan Buddha that if his monks who go into retreat recite the various Paritran suttas such as Ratan Sutta, Atanatiya Sutta and the like, their retinue of yakshas would fend off any other yakshas that came to create obstacles for them. And it is a similar thing that happened with Guru Padma Sambhav. It is not anything different than what is said in the Theravadi suttas themselves. And it is after this that Shiva and Dakshin Kali were taken as dharmapals or dharma protectors. There are innumerable dharmapals such as these, including the gods and goddesses of Tibet, who were subdued and converted into dharmapals by Guru Padma Sambhav when he went there. In India also, many surrendered themselves to the Buddha. There were many yakshas who came to challenge the Buddha, but how would they ever have been able to win against Bhagwan Buddha? And many other gods and goddesses like Indra also came and received teachings from him. And many are said to have attained Shrotapanna, or the stage of stream enterer, right there and then. We will talk about this further later on. In the Diga Nikayas Parinibbana Sutta, it is said that Chakra, also known as Indra, and 80,000 gods and goddesses attained Shrotapanna while they were listening to the teachings of the Buddha. And these gods and goddesses are called Dharmapal in the Vajrayan tradition. And there are two places in the Pali Anguttar Nikaya also where they are referred to by the Buddha as Bali Grahak Devata, that is as gods and goddesses who are worthy of being given Bali offerings. This is why they are given Bali offerings in Vajrayan. Offerings are made to Shiva not because one is his devotee, but because he is a dharmapal or dharma protector. And the offering is to remind him that he had made a pledge to our Guru, that he had given him his word. 
So from this itself, it is apparent whether or not Guru Padma Sambhav is a devotee of Shiva. Shiva is acknowledged in Vajrayan, and the Hemavat Sutta also states that he had received teachings from Bhagwan Buddha. Buddha bhane kuta sastha deva manusya naam, devata ra manusya ko sastha guru. Buddha is said to be Shasta Deva Manushya Nam, meaning that he is the Shasta or Guru of both gods and humans. This subject will also be dealt with later while answering other questions. But to answer this question here, Avadut Baba, just like alluded to in the saying earlier that everyone who is dark skinned is Mahadev's brother in law, fabricated that Guru Padma Sambhav is a devotee of Shiva just because he carries a Katwanga that appears to resemble a Trishul. I do not know him and have not even heard of him, but he for sure must have thousands of disciples, including in Nepal, who consider him to be a great guru. And as such a famous guru, it is not proper for him to speak about subjects he has no knowledge of. One should have the sincerity to admit to not knowing about something they have no knowledge of. On what basis is he claiming that Guru Padma Sambhav is a devotee of Shiva? In which sutra has this been written? Where is this written in any Mahayan sutra or in any Vajrayan tantra? The Nigmas of the Himalayan region are all devotees of Guru Padma Sambhav. And thus through him they are also automatically devotees of Buddha Shakyamuni. Guru Padma Sambhav studied at Nalanda and the teachings at Nalanda came from Shakyamuni. It was a place where the teachings of the Buddha were studied. Thus Guru Padma Sambhav was a devotee of Shakyamuni, not of Shiva. There is only one possibility for why a person like Avadud Baba, who has already become a renowned Guru, makes such a statement. And that is because he mistook the Khatwanga to be a Trishu. But this logic is synonymous to say that all types of cutting implements are actually kukuris and that because a kukuri is used for killing people and a sword is also used for that, anyone carrying a sword is thus a gorkhali. गुरु भाने को चेला ले गुरु को परीक्षण करने पर सा गुरु ले चेला को परीक्षण करने पर सा दूसरे परीक्षण हो। In Vajrayan, the disciple needs to examine the guru, and the guru also needs to examine the disciple. Analysis is done on both sides. There is a saying that it is not difficult to find a guru, but it is difficult to find a disciple. And the relationship between guru and disciple is one in which it is the disciple who needs to practice and not the guru. The guru is the one who shows the path. And showing the path here does not mean that the guru then just steps aside, but rather in Vajrayan, the guru becomes the path. That is why the disciple should first examine the guru. There is a saying in Vajrayan that one should take 12 years if need be to see whether someone is fit to be one's guru and to decide to make them your guru or not. And after that, once you have accepted them as your guru, close your eyes. This does not mean to close one's eyes regarding all matters, but is specifically in reference to matters of the path and methods of practice. The Guru should be someone who is well versed in the Shastras, Sutras and Tantras. He or she should be someone who has complete faith in the Three Jewels. And we should investigate whether the teachings given by them are in contradiction with the teachings of the Buddha or not. For example, when Shariputra was asked if he had faith in his Guru, who in this case was the Buddha, he said that he did not. And when asked how could someone like him not have faith in the Buddha, Shariputra replied that he did not need to have faith because he knew that what the Buddha taught was true. That is why one needs to have already studied Buddha Dharma first. Because in order to examine the Guru, in order to know whether someone is qualified enough to be my Guru or not, I myself need to have knowledge of the Dharma first. Thus, one needs to study the Dharma first, to listen to the teachings, which is Shutamayi Pragya or wisdom from hearing. 
and then contemplate on it, which is chintamayi pragya, or wisdom from contemplation, and then meditate on it. Then one can see whether the teachings of the Guru are in contradiction to the tantras, sutras, and shastras or not. And understand this well, that tantra is not in contradiction to sutras, and sutras are not in contradiction to suttas. There will be differences in the finer points, in the hermeneutics, and what is emphasized, but there is no contradiction per se. For example, Bodhisattva Yan also takes the shield or precepts as is done in Shravagyan, and they are maintained accordingly. However, for the benefit of others, and here benefit does not mean in a general mundane sense, but refers specifically to benefit related to dharma. And thus, if there is a spiritual benefit to others, a bodhisattva is ready and willing to break his or her shield. This is found in the Theravadi Jatak story itself, in the Harita Jatak, that a bodhisattva can break all shield except for the truth. These shield cannot be broken in any way in Travakyan, but they can be in Bodhisattva Yan. But in what context? Not for one's self-interest, but only for the benefit of others. Thus the Guru should be one who has these qualities, who understands these matters, and is able to make others understand them as well. And Tantrayan does not contradict Bodhisattva Yan. Thus, there is no possibility at all of practices like animal sacrifice in Tantrayan. That is not Vajrayan, it is a distortion. If a puja or offering ritual includes the slaughtering of goats and such, and if they are Guvajus or Newar priests who conduct such pujas, then that is not Vajrayan, and that is not Buddha Dharma. That is Hindu Dharma. It is practicing Hindu Dharma under the guise of Vajrayan. For example, if I wish to learn about the sciences, I need to learn from scientists. One cannot become a scientist merely by studying a few books on their own. I have to learn from a scientist. That is what a teacher, master or guru means. Whether it is the Shavakyan, Paramitayan or Vajrayan, one needs to learn from a teacher. It is not enough to read books. Reading a few books or even ten or even a thousand books is not enough especially with regard to Vajrayan, in which the teachings are written in Sandhya Bhasha, or twilight language. In Sandhya Bhasha, the meaning of the words used are not literal. The majority of the Vajrayan teachings are written in Sandhya Bhasha. And did Bhagwan Buddha also speak in Sandhya Bhasha? This is clearly seen in the Dhammapad itself, where he has said, kill the king, kill the ministers, etc. Now, did Bhagwan Buddha really mean that one should kill the king or kill the ministers here? No, he is referring to something else. His words mean something else. What he really means is kill the Atma, or the notion of a really existing self, or kill one's ego, and such. The Vajrayan texts are primarily written in this style, and thus it is not something that can be understood just by reading books. One needs to learn from a guru who comes from a pure, unbroken, enlightened lineage. And then one makes the decision to take on such a guru as one's own. And once this decision has been made, for example, deciding that I want to study with Einstein, then until I have learned everything he has to teach, I need to stay on the path that the guru points to without questioning. One can still raise questions with the guru even in Tantrayan, but in regard to the path, one needs to step where he points to. This is also called pratipada or patipati. One does not question why and what for and such on the path. If, when we listen to the teachings given by a guru, we find them to be congruent with the sutras, shastras and tantras and not in contradiction with them, which would mean that they are also in alignment with the commentarial tradition of the lineage, since these themselves would never be in contradiction to the sutras, shastras, or tantras, then we should learn from such a guru. Or go karma lini oina. Maybe, Bhagavan Buddha swam lini or go karma lini oina. 
हैं न छाले ऐंते मुने मुने यो जले न पापम जल पोखेरा पाप काटनी होई ना। We cannot take on someone else's karma. As I have said, even Bhagwan Buddha himself does not take on someone else's karma. No chala yanti munayo jalena papam, meaning that the sages do not wash away your sins with water. Naiva pakara shanti karena jagat dukham, nor take away with their hands the suffering of the world. Naiva chas sankramate anyeshu swadhi gama nor transfer their realizations to others. Here, adigam means realization. So when we talk about agam and adigam, agam refers to the recitation of sutras or suttas, and adigam is the experience. The adigam also needs to come from an unbroken, enlightened lineage. There are teachings on adigam which come from gurus of the lineage, meaning that a realized guru will have teachings on adigam and the realized Guru before him will also have his teachings on Adigam and so on. And this Adigam is not transferable to someone else. And then, Sadharmata Deshanaya Vimochayanti, meaning that they liberate by giving the correct Dharma. Thus we should understand this well, that even a Guru or Bodhisattvas or anyone else do not take someone else's non-virtuous karmas. Perhaps the person who asked this question was referring to the practice of Tonglen, which involves taking in the non-virtuous karmas and such of others, visualized in the form of black smoke, and giving them our own merits in exchange. But this is actually a practice and is not about literally taking others' non-virtuous karmas onto ourselves. It is a practice I engage in, in order to become a Buddha, and thereafter, teach dharma in order to alleviate the suffering of others. It is not possible for me to take on someone else's karma. Nobody can take another's karma. This question can actually be asked about Christ in Christianity also. How can he take on everyone's karma or sins? It is one thing to say that people would be freed by following his dharma or teachings, but how can he take everyone's sins? This is not in accordance with the principle of karma nor is it consistent with the principle of causes and conditions, nor with the principle of cause and result. It cannot be that the karma performed by one person is endured by someone else, nor that someone can take on another's karma because they wish to. This is not possible. यो प्रश्न मा जुन आधार में यो प्रश्न बोले हो कि वो नहीं गलत सा गणेश चक्र पूजा नाम पूजा वैधा पनी त्यो पूजा बंदा पनी समय त्रुटि को शोधन करने तरीका हो। The premise on which this question is based is itself wrong. The practice of गणेश चक्र पूजा, which also includes the word puja or offering ritual. Is actually a method of repairing one's broken samayas or vajrayan vows, rather than being merely a puja. In order for a vajrayan practitioner to become a Buddha, he or she needs to have maintained pure samaya. The shields, samvars, and samayas should all be maintained purely. The samvars are already included in the samayas because abandoning bodhicitta would be a breakage of one of the samayas. And sugatagya vilangane, which means transgressing the instructions of the sugat or the Buddha, including the five precepts or ten precepts, etc., is also breakage of another samaya. Thus, both the shil and samvars are automatically included within the samayas. Some newars here are under the illusion that one does not need to follow any shil in vajrayan, that those are only part of shavakyan or theravad and not of our Vajrayan. Such statements are only made by people who have not understood Vajrayan, which is also called Tantrayan or Mantrayan. Only those who have not studied it at all and have only learned the rituals, etc., make such statements. Because as soon as one receives an Abhishek or empowerment, the Samayas are also taken along with that then. Just like how one takes the Panchashil or five precepts along with taking refuge. The Panchashil are included within those Samayas, 
and bodhicitta is also included in the samayas. Thus, these are not contradictory, and the difference is only in what is emphasized. So both shil and samvar are continued along with the samayas. And gana chakra is done in order to repair the samayas, because we as human beings repeatedly break them. It involves inviting the Buddhas, Vajrayogini and other Gurus, Bodhisattvas, etc. and confessing our mistakes in their presence and asking for forgiveness for breaking our Samayas. This is the significance of Gana Chakra. Puja alone of Vajrayogini or of Nairatmya is not Gana Chakra. Now if one is practicing the Vajrayan path of Bodhisattvayan, one must perform Gana Chakra. Because if there are a lot of Samaya breakages, then one goes to hell. It is said that even those who continue breaking their shil or precepts will go to the hell realm or lower realms, and similarly those who break their bodhisattva sambars also go to the hell realm or lower realms. Likewise, those who receive tantra abhisheks or empowerments and do those practices but keep breaking their Samaya, either go to hell or to other lower realms. It is for this reason that Gana Chakra is done. And Gana Chakra does not mean merely doing puja of Vajra Yogini or He Vajra. Puja will be included within Gana Chakra. They are being invited and so there will be puja for them. But only a puja of Vajra Yogini or puja of He Vajra is something different. The purpose of Gana Chakra is to make confessions, ask for forgiveness and make a resolution to not repeat the breakage again. This is purification, that is, the earlier Samaya breakages are purified. Thus it was because Shakyamuni continued to purify his breakages that he became a Buddha. This is the point. And not that he became a Buddha only as a result of doing pujas of Vajrayogini, etc. But since Shakyamuni practiced Sutrayan, it took him three immeasurable eons to become a Buddha. Because he was a Buddha, he also knew Vajrayan methods, but his practice was based on Sutrayan, and it is said that he practiced for three or four immeasurable eons. And it can be said that he practiced Vajrayan in the Akpanishta heavenly realm in the final stage and transcended. Thus when Vajrayan is practiced, Gana Chakra must be done, which results in purification of one's Samaya breakages. This is the meaning of Gana Chakra. The question here implies that he became a Buddha simply by performing pujas of Vajrayogini, Nairatmya, etc., in the same way that pujas of Krishna, etc., are done. But what does Nairatmya mean? It means anatma, or non-self. That is the meaning of Nairatmya. Likewise, what is Vajrayogini, or He Vajra? They are Chitta, or mind. They are Buddha. And what kind of Buddha? They are not Buddhas like Shakyamuni Buddha, nor the future Buddha Maitreya, but in the sense that Chitta, or mind, itself is Buddha. Thus the mind itself is Buddha. The Hevaja Tantra states, Na Buddho Labate Lokadhatushu Kutrachit, which means that Buddha is not found anywhere in any of the realms of existence. Chittam Evahi Sambuddho, the mind itself is Buddha. The Theravadi Ajancha, who is considered to be an Arhat by the Thai people and who passed away relatively recently, I am not sure exactly when, but around 10 or 20 years ago, as he was still alive in the 90s or 2000s. I think he passed away in 2007. But he wrote this very thing in a letter to a disciple of his who was about to die. Once everything dissolves and once your breath stops, in the end, only the mind will remain. That mind is Buddha, the Buddha who never dies. Shakyamuni Buddha has already died. This is what he wrote. Naratmya, Vajrayogini, Chakrasambar, He Vajra, etc. are all related to this mind. They are not like Buddha Shakyamuni. One attains Buddhahood by making use of them, by applying the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. And within Vajrayan, pujas are offered to them, but this is like making puja offerings to one's own mind. Pujas are performed by those who have taken the empowerment, and when one has taken the empowerment, we ourselves become Vajrayogini or He Vajra, etc. These are profound teachings and cannot be revealed openly here, 
but I have said this much in the context of the question. The puja of Vajrayogini or Nairatmya is not done in the way that puja of Krishna is done, because they are the mind itself. They are not some other thing, but rather the mind itself. The practitioners themselves become Vajrayogini, Chakrasambhar or Hivaja. What this means is that they become a Buddha. But this happens only after they have fully accomplished the practice. And thus, what is it? It is the mind itself. What is it related to? It is related to the nature of mind. And what is the nature of mind related to? It is related to the verse I have talked about in earlier episodes. Prabhasaram idam bhikave chittam adi tiyo sangha sammansa. Prabhasaram idam bhikave chittam meaning, O monks, this mind is luminous, etc. The Guru should be someone who possesses this teaching. And it is in this context that the practice of Gana Chakra also arises. One does not just perform the Gana Chakra Puja out of this context. Yes, it should be performed, but there is a reason why it is performed, which is to purify one's Samaya.